I'm going to be introducing our next speaker. It is a true pleasure to introduce you to Heidi Sanborn. Heidi is a trailblazer. She's tenacious. She's passionate. She's been working in our industry for over the past 25 years to move the, di the dial in support and success for EPR and product stewardship, both at the local, state, national, and international level. Her tenacity, her drive is contagious. She makes people accountable. It's wonderful to get to work with her. It's a wonderful opportunity. She's the type of person that doesn't let me be non-responsive. She will call me and email me until I respond. And, and that's amazing, and that's what we need. We need leaders and inspirational leaders. Heidi is somebody, when I saw her speak, um, several years ago at a SWANA conference. I grew up in Los Angeles. I grew up around movie stars. I never needed, I never wanted, uh, you know, um, signatures or anything like that. When I saw Heidi speak, I couldn't wait to go get her signature and get to know her because she's just so amazing and cool. So it is a pure pleasure to introduce Heidi up to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. So good to be here, and thank you again, Colleen. That was so funny. I was, and awesome, and and really, uh, I'm so excited to be here after 10 years of running California Product Stewardship Council. We're all here together because now we have to figure out what we're going to do the next 10 years. So I thought I'd uh, title this the the perfect storm that California needs to be a beacon of hope. And I should figure out how to put this. Let's see. So, you know, every time I come to these conferences, I feel like we're at a family reunion, and we're just having a blast. Um, but we do a lot of really important work here. Everybody here has a very important role to play, and it's just an honor to be part of this group. I think all of us have felt this year that there's a lot of stuff that we could be bummed out about, right? But when we come into this room, we got to fill each other's tanks up. And... One of the things we're excited to celebrate, as we said, is the 10th anniversary of this organization because I'll tell you. <laughs> thank you. It wasn't easy to start a nonprofit in the worst economy of our lifetime. And to do it, to go up against the industry groups that have a lot more money than we do, and to change an entire paradigm, it takes time, it takes thought, and it takes collaboration. It takes a, an army. And all of you are part of that army. So we'll celebrate that tonight, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But why did we form the Product Stewardship Council? Basically, is because we were done, the local governments were done with the disposal bans without management plans. Thanks to Evan Edgar. No ban without a plan. Um, DTC was banning batteries and all kinds of stuff from disposal, and local governments were like, wait a minute, I don't have the money. I don't know how we're going to do this. We don't want 500 different messages to the public. It just doesn't make any sense. It's not cost effective. So they, they looked at the producer responsibility model as a policy model that might be able to help um, get us out of this quagmire. So again, there's a lot going on that we're not happy about, but we have absolutely no time to sit around and mull over it. The news is what it is, and our diversion rate has gone down. So what do we do? We double down. We double down. But the question is, what are we going to double down on? The true definition of madness is when we keep repeating the same action over and over and expect a different result. That was Einstein. So doing what we've been doing has worked to a point, but now we've got to be bold and try some new bigger policy approaches, and some of these are going to be hard. But there's lots of good news. We've all done a lot of good work. Hundreds of jurisdictions are taking action on food packaging, on bags, on medicines, needles, etc. The governor's office and CalRecycle are amazing. We couldn't be more grateful for their amazing leadership. We've got statewide EPR laws now and product stewardship laws. We've got eight local laws passed. We have a Supreme Court that actually rejected the pharma complaint that the Alameda ordinance was illegal. That's a game changer. I mean, that changed the rules. Every one of you, all the local governments can pass an ordinance making the producers pay for any product that has a public health impact. Do you know that, that if you watch the video of the hearing, the lawyers were actually, the guy who actually did the hanging Chad thing for Bush, he was their lawyer. And he was like, do you know if you let this happen, like every county in the whole country is going to do ordinances? And they're like, yeah, it might happen. So get over it. 
So that was huge. And we also defeated what? Their opposition to try and preempt you, AB 45. Congratulations, you killed the preemption bill last year. That was huge too. Um, we've got a state law to achieve 75%. That's gonna keep the pressure on. And public surveys are showing us that the polluter pays model is what the public wants. So there's lots of really good news for us to springboard from. So there's no time to despair. It's time and it's a perfect storm for producer responsibility and some bold policy approaches that we might not have been able to try before. We cannot continue to just keep pushing on local governments to fix everything at the back end. There just isn't enough money and there's not enough resources and it's not really that efficient. So we've got organics and packaging and textiles and bulky items and green products and all of that we need to get to 50, the next 50%. But at some point, producers have to help us with green design and they have to help pay for these programs if we can't get good markets. They have to help. So the last waste characterization study in California shows where our big ticket items are. It's food, lumber, composite paper, bulky items, our organics, textiles, as Bob mentioned. It's a lot of the same stuff. So we know what we gotta go after and we gotta start moving fast. But there's a lot of power and all the people in this room Local governments, Cal Recycle, NGOs, and private sector partners. We're stronger together. And I will tell you, watching what's going on in the Capitol, day after day, that the opponents to these tougher approaches that are tough politically to pass, this is what they do in order to kill the stuff we want. They move in a pack, and I'm not exaggerating, literally a pack, and I call them the Italian Suit Brigade. And they walk around, and they lobby, and they do all kinds of, you know, they'll say almost anything really to get their way, it's kind of shocking. Um, they give a lot of money to campaigns and I hope all of you know your elected official and they know you by your first name and they know to call you if they have a solid waste question or a question on recycling or what's happening with the carpet bill, should I support this? If you guys aren't active with your local elected officials who will then become the next state elected officials who then become the people in Congress and then sometimes get elected to president, it's a, it's a missed opportunity. We have to all become very political even though we're not party affiliated. I mean, at least we are apolitical as an organization. But we have to be political and smart. Um, they're also good social engineers. In Los Angeles, in order to successfully delay right now the LA County Ordinance on Medicines and Sharps, uh, they actually hired as far as we know, we were told from people in the industry, every single lobbyist that existed in Los Angeles. They hired almost every PR firm as well that wasn't conflicted out. And there's a lot conflicted out because pharma gives, does a lot of commercials. Um, and they actually called senior citizens in LA and told them that their ordinance was gonna, was gonna skyrocket drug prices. And then sent them a model letter with typos and everything to send in. And we outed them in the LA Times. But this is the kind of stuff, they actually are good at getting people who should support these things to oppose them. So this is where you have to be, keep your eyes open, talk to your public, make sure you're, you're keeping your fingers on the pulse of what's going on. Because before you know it, people are confused and they're voting for the wrong things that are actually detrimental to their own best interests. We do have to get to the source of waste, and that is on the manufacturer, on the producer product side, we have to get to the producers. So they can have voluntary programs and we can have mandatory, what we call extended producer responsibility programs. And California is hope for the entire US right now. We're seeing a dismantling of the EPA from the inside out. Um, and everybody's looking to California for hope out there. So no other state has the power that we have to drive market change because we're 12% of the entire population of this country. If we change something in California, industries actually change the entire system to comply. So we have a much greater impact than, let's say, a Vermont or a, a much smaller state. Um, and a lot of people call us crazy, but I say we're crazy like a fox. <laughs> because we will and we have created green jobs and we're creating a green circular economy but it's important that we not just talk about it. We need to do it. We need to be the beacon of light for everyone around the country right now. So changing to the circular economy is hard, but for the love of country, for the love of the planet, we've got to do it. It's hard and we're gonna do it anyway. So Cal Recycle has had the strategic directive now for years to do cradle to cradle producer responsibility 
and develop relationships with stakeholders that result in producer finance and managed systems. So we've got the policy, we just need to start execution on more of these policies. Um, the OECD, the Organization for Economic and Cooperation and Development, they define EPR as an environmental policy approach in which producers' responsibility for a product is extended to the post-consumer stage of a product's life cycle. And the reason for that is not only to shift responsibility away from the governments to do everything, but to provide incentives for the producers to incorporate environmental considerations in the design of their products, because it's always follow the money. The responsibility of the producer can be physical, financial, and or informational. And according to the OECD, and this is extremely important, the internalization of external environmental costs is considered a fundamental aspect of environmental policy design. Why is that? Because when they can externalize the costs onto all of you and the taxpayers and the garbage rate payers, they don't pay. And what is the business language? It's money. They are corporations and they have a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders to make money. Unless they're a B Corp, they do not answer to people and planet. They only answer to profit. So what have we been doing about this the last 10 years? Well, we've been pretty busy. And we have great websites, and we did a lot of education about EPR. We've got uh, product pages. Um, we've done thousands of presentations. Um, we've helped pass resolutions with all of you in local governments. If you don't have a resolution, we'd love to help you get one. We've incorporated zero waste goals and EPR in the same resolution. Um, we've helped pass legislation, some with industry, some without them. Um, is there a tornado or something? <laughs> is there a bus? We aren't going to blow away, are we? An Amber Alert? Oh. Is there a little girl we can get or something? What's going on? Um, does that stay on very long? <laughs> Somebody find this child? Okay. All right, that's, okay, very good. Hopefully the child is fine. Um, we don't want to wish, I mean, seriously, that always concerns me when Amber Alerts come on. I've got it on my phone. Um, for thermostats, so one of the things we did was help pass the first true producer responsibility bill in, the, in California. It's about mercury thermostats, and people think, eh, it's not sexy, mercury thermostats, but those things have a lot of mercury. Those ampules, are full of mercury and a teaspoon can contaminate an entire lake. It's the largest pool of mercury in the public's hands and we're literally collecting less than 30% of it. So when the Thermostat Recycling Corporation didn't do a very good job, what did we do? We actually designed a competing stewardship plan and I have very good news for you. We got the results last week, it's on the DTSC website and we actually got, they got 8% recycling rate last year for the um, thermostats they were supposed to collect and we got 182% in three months. So, thank you. We're very proud of that. And so our, our message out to the producers is if we give you control of the program, you better do it. Because if you don't, we're going to show you how it's done. And then, that's just how it's going to be. Because we knew what needed to be done, and we were talking to them about it for the last eight years. We want to be helpful. We want these to work. But if they refuse to really let them work, we have to, we have to prove the, the point. Um, carpet. Now, do we think this was a perfect bill? Absolutely not. We helped pass it with our noses plugged, but the reason we did it was why? Who else has this tiger by the tail? No one. We are the only ones in the world that have the carpet industry talking about recycling or source reduction or green design or anything. And I want to say thanks to our friends at Interface and Tarquette because they have taken the lead and DSM Niaga to help us fix this bill with AB 1158 this year, we need to get it done, and we have industry leaders who are helping us do that. And they are here today, and we're going to thank some of them tonight. So, um, but the good news is sometimes you have to see incremental change, but we are the only ones that can, they've killed all the other bills in the country so far. I want to thank Paint Care, Jeremy and his team. So I worked on that for many, many years. Um, we now have over 800 drop-off sites, and I think we started with like 50, and they were mostly household hazardous waste um, programs, and I know many of you have saved millions of dollars from this program, so thank you on that. 
Bye Bye Mattress, thanks to Michael Donnell and his team. Probably the smoothest rollout we've had so far of the stewardship programs. Thank you for that to Mike and his team. Are we perfect yet? No, we're still working on it. There's still things that need to be done, but these are important things that take time. And a state of the size of California is like a country. It really is hard to do and it takes some time. We've created awards to help thank businesses for taking uh, the leadership on these programs. This is uh, Sam with Flame King and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, the refillable one pound propane cylinders. We've partnered with uh, our friends at Call to Recycle. Is Sean here? Always appreciate Sean Birchall and Call to Recycle. Um, they have actually helped us put out these boxes that are co-collected of uh, not just the rechargeables, but alkalines. We've collected 25 tons in partnering with some of, of your local jurisdictions. And we're proving the point that if the producers can pay and they can do these kinds of programs, they work. We've got to make it easy for people. Um, and this is our Refuel Your Fun campaign. Uh, we created this a few years ago because of Sam coming to us and saying, I redesigned the one pound propane cylinder to be refillable. So mo most of you probably go camping or use these for grills or, um, gosh, lawn equipment. There's so many different things, scooters, all kinds of stuff now. And these can be refilled for 12 years. And a California company redesigned them to be refillable. So uh, we actually have seven of them. And of course, you don't want to take this on a plane. So if you're flying, don't try to get one. But if you are driving and you would like one, you can like our Refuel Your Fun Facebook page. And Jordan is going to, the first seven people who like it, will get one of these for free at the end of the presentation. So, uh, and we'd love to have your help promoting that campaign. Because to us, it's a win-win. When industries are now coming to us and saying, can you help us? We want to read, you know, change the paradigm of our entire industry. We're like so grateful and we just want to help them. Because then if we help them, others will come too. We, um, and these are a huge problem for the parks. That's a pile at Yosemite. They spend about $28,000 a year just managing these cylinders. Um, again, they last for 12 years, so hopefully everybody can help promote them. We'll all help you promote them. Jordan Wells is our awesome uh, project manager, campaign manager over there, and you can talk to her after the presentation. And we were, there's Jordan, and we actually uh, got in sports basement in the Bay Area, they've got eight stores, and they're now um, giving their basementers free exchanges. So um, people will buy the refillable, and then they bring it back for a free exchange full. And that's what they've decided to do for their customers. And we're starting to collect them into HEMA, and that cart actually was filled up in two weeks. And we're filling them up every week or two. There are so many that we're going into the trash. And I don't know if you've heard, but there have been big MRF fires lately because of these one pound propane cylinders getting into the trash and being compacted. We've also done the Don't Rush to Flush Meds in the Bin We All Win program. We've won awards for this. We've got, I don't know, 60 or so bins out now across the state. We just finished with our last eight bins in Monterey. Um, and this, we've collected many, many tons of medicines. Um, just in Santa Clara, in their 29 bins, we've collected four and a half tons, tons of medicines. And these get flushed a lot if people are left to, you know, because they are told by FDA still to flush. And we've done a great little whiteboard video. So if you want to, I wish I had time to play it. It's very cute. And we can customize it and put your logos at the end. And when now we're doing one also for the Refuel Your Fun campaign. So we're able to share all of this. And if you can help us share it, we'll be happy to customize it for you. But really, Alameda is, the I think, the biggest win we've had in the last 10 years. Um, Supervisor Nate Miley on the left of the yellow tie and Supervisor Carson on the right, they were the bulldogs. Um, Mr. Miley led the charge on meds and then on needles was Supervisor Carson. He had somebody in his district who was remodeling and opened the wall and had literally thousands of needles fall out of the wall. Because when people don't know what to do, what do they do? Well, whatever crafty thing they can come up with. So they put a hole in the wall and started disposing of their needles in the wall. So, yeah, you just can't make this stuff up. <laughs> when we did surveys of what people were doing with their meds, they literally said, we self-incinerate. We put it on the barbecue. And we're like, what? And one person says, oh, I buried it out by the back fence post, and I watched the squirrels dig it up and run away. And we're just like, what? <sighs> Sorry, it's why I drink before noon some days. I don't know what's going on. 
But these gentlemen are awesome. And if it weren't for these elected officials, we would really be in a spot. So we want to really all be grateful for our elected officials, local, state, and federal, who are willing to stand up for these tough fights. Um, and we got in the news, you know, the Wall Street Journal, because Pharma was saying silly things, you know, like, no, there's no problem and all that. And so we said, no, yeah, there's a problem. And then we went to the, they filed lawsuit against Alameda and said this was a, a violation of the Commerce Clause, Interstate Commerce Clause. And a lot of good things came out of that, actually, because what I consider this is the legal rules of the road of EPR have been laid. So the federal court did, if you ever want to watch walk, wonk television, this was it. The 45 minutes, these three really smart judges debated with these two lawyers. And they came down with um, a three, Oh, ruling for Alameda. And um, unfortunately, the pharmaceutical industry, instead of just saying, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll try and help this national um, epidemic, they decided to fight all the way to the US Supreme Court. And the good news is the court denied hearing the case, which is huge. Um, this, this is landmark, but again, it's not for every product. So I just want to make sure everybody's clear. If you decide you want to go after diapers, I'm not sure they're going to say that's a health and safety impact. If you go after medicines and needles, they definitely will. So just be careful. And I'll talk to you about it if you're interested in taking on a product. I'm pretty sure everything hazardous would qualify, but be careful going forward. Um, but you do have now the right to go forward. So the California counties who have led in this are on the screen. These are the ones who have passed EPR ordinances on medicines and or sharps. And I want to congratulate Tim Goncharoff, the new CRA board member from Santa Cruz, for the first in the country, both medicines and sharps passed in Santa Cruz. Yay, Tim. And the fun thing about this is they actually pay you to oversee them. Isn't that nice? So if your budget's tight, this is a great option because they actually have to pay the governments, and this is the first check to Alameda for $10,000 from the MED project um, to pay them for the program. And the great news is the bins are out. They're doing one-day events, but we're also getting, I think we have 120 bins or so in now, and these are the MED project bins. They are electronic and will send a signal that they're full, so they're automatically emptied, very easy. Um, and then we want to thank Walgreens. We're going to thank them tonight at the awards ceremony. We had a press conference yesterday here at the Walgreens in San Diego. But they've put 600 of these medication bins voluntarily in their stores at the 24-hour stores around the country. Um, and I think we have like 54 here in California. But they've collected over 72 tons by the end of April. Isn't that crazy? It's awesome. So we have a huge chain that's leading the way, and we want to thank, thank, thank them and get some tons of press, but our hope is that we can get them to expand to all 7,200 Walgreens. Um, and we've taken on this needles and medicines issue for a while. We've not been able to get them passed at the state level, but these are, this is a city of Burbank team. This is seven months worth of needles that they have hand sorted off the sort line. They had 10% of their staff stuck, two of 20 people. That to me is criminal that we are exposing our people and our industry to this. And I really, really hope we can all come together and get something done this next year on medicines and needles at the state level. But all of you doing the local work is what's pushing them to come to the table and talk at the state level. So please keep it up. If you want to do an ordinance, please let us know and we'll help you do it. And we want to be very grateful for Senator Hannah Beth Jackson out of Santa Barbara. She's a rock star. Um, we've given her awards. She's the one that's held the bar high on EPR for medicines. And she was very frustrated when we had this like five pages of support for the pharma bill and then only five opposition, which are associations of medicine manufacturers. And we still couldn't get out of second committee. They give a lot of money to campaigns. Our lobbyist says he thinks it's every single legislator is taking money from pharma. Um, so this is a tough lift, and uh, Senator Jackson then got frustrated and said, well, I'm sending a letter to all the counties to tell them, please do an ordinance so we can get the tension at the, at the state level. She also signed on and worked with uh, Assembly Members Ting and Gray, bless you, um, and we got a state audit report done, and they said, yes, we should have a state-based solution, but EPR is hard, and we're like, yeah, no kidding, we've been trying. <laughs> Yes, it is hard. It doesn't mean it's not worth doing. So the thing is, is we are all going to have to come together and fight on this because until we're finished with this fight, pharma will fight every other bill. They opposed the battery bill because they were mad about the pharma bill. 
So that's literally where we're at. We've got to finish this. Um, the Board of Pharmacy, unfortunately, came out with a rule, and they're trying to preempt you, too. The Board of Pharmacy regulations actually said that if you've passed mandatory retail take back on drugs, the pharmacist can still say no. So I'm daring them in Santa Cruz County to do that to Tim, because I don't think his county's going to appreciate that. Because <laughs> he made it mandatory for retailers to participate. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Um, but the other thing we've been doing is we've been getting so much press and so much support from across the country. People are calling us and we're like, well, we can't do that. We're California. So our board said it's time. So we formed a national C4, meaning we have unlimited lobbying capacity. And that's what we needed to do. So we're the, thank you. So we formed the National Stewardship Action Council. We're going to advocate for a circular economy. We helped Chicago pass an EPR ordinance on medicines. We're helping other counties right now and other states, which will remain unnamed at this point in time. Um, but um, we'd love for you to follow us. We've got Facebook pages, et cetera. And we're working with our colleagues like at the Texas Product Stewardship Council. We signed an MOU with them, and they're helping us promote Refuel Your Fund in Texas now. So there's ways for us all to duplicate the good work we've done here in California. Um, and our priorities for this, this, at this point in time, at least through next year, are to expand Refuel Your Fund, because that's voluntary, it's working, we should make that the paradigm change uh, on, on the one pound gas, propane gas cylinders. We need to pass the carpet cleanup bill, and we need to do it this year. That program has gained 8% recycling in eight years. Does anybody think 1% recycling increase a year is a good program? I don't. We got a long way to go. This is heavy. It's 99% plastic. It's got a huge greenhouse gas footprint. There's lots of reasons we need to get it back, and there's lots of jobs to be created. Um, we've got to get LA County to pass the ordinance on medicines and sharps, and we think we can do it. We'll be getting very busy on that very soon, um, and get the statewide solution also. But I want to thank Craig Hample. We're going to give him an award tonight, too, because he's awesome in Burbank. He's been out there testifying and fighting for his workers and saying it's not right that needles are coming across the sort line like this and sticking my people. Um, so we're going to stay on it until we get it done. Uh, but I'm going to talk very briefly for a minute about packaging, because that is a big part of what we've got to get at to get to 75% and beyond. It's a big issue on a whole lot of levels. Water's one of them. So on the right is the picture in Long Beach um, after or before a rainstorm, and then, of course, the one on the left is after with all the packaging. And I think we all, this just turns our stomach, right? I mean, this isn't how it's supposed to be. So there's lots of different ways to get this stuff out. There's bans, there's producer responsibility, there's hybrids. Let's not fight over exactly, you know, what is the right, we're a family, we have a family reunion here, let's have our debates here, but when we finally come to agreement and we're going forward, we have to back each other up. The industries we are up against are well-funded, they're not very nice, and they're gonna come. They're gonna come, and as, as Bob mentioned, they, have, they came in Nova Scotia, they're gonna fight here, and we have to do better than what we're doing now, because we're going backwards. So let's, fi we'll figure it out, we'll figure it out, and we'll be the beacon of hope. But just, because one of the things we do is research and just sharing information. We're not saying this is the right way at all. We're just saying, here's some facts. So in the Czech Republic, in their packaging EPR system, between 2002 and 2014, you can see how much recycling and packaging they have increased, you know, between uh, glass, plastic, overall paper, et cetera. The trends are all up. Spain, same thing. Ireland, same thing. I could go through the entire EU, and that's the way it is. So it's not that there's one right way. Let's cherry pick the best of the best for California. Let's do our research. Let's talk about facts. But at the end of the day, we've got some tough policies we got to get done in order to get to 75 by 2020. So we got to move. Um, and I just want to say one thing about local um, recycling. People have said that it's um, local recycling will be devastated, and I can assure you it probably could be. So the devil is in the details. Everybody's got to pay attention to these laws and read them for yourself. Don't just say what, you know, repeat what we're saying. Read them. If you like it, support it. But we're going to need everybody kind of working towards a goal. Um, and I can say that we're at the place now we're actually getting on NBC Nightly News. Uh, this is um, recently on Blue Apron. And I said again, 
the customers have a role too, to, to not want all this packaging and tell the manufacturers no. So, mission aligned army to-do list. Get political, go to town halls, know your legislators, attend fundraisers and give money to the people who are doing things. You can do it personally even though you can't do it maybe organizationally. Pass local ordinances, that's where the power is. Preach to a new choir, we need more people and a bigger army. Help make this issue a higher priority in the media. You can do that with getting op-eds, getting your elected officials to write about it, and reframe the issues if you feel like it's not working. So if we're talking about, should we talk about straws and EPS, or maybe we should talk about fast food industry. That's what Tim did, he took the whole fast food industry on and got it all managed out of fast food. Um, you can pass a resolution, get your policy undocumented. You can support our programs and campaigns. And then activate all the groups that you, you know of um, that are working together. Fund one of us at least. Go out there and speak up. Um, and I'm very proud of our board. I want to thank our board. After 10 years, we've worked so hard and they are just awesome. And I couldn't be, I feel like the luckiest executive director in the world, honestly. So thank you. And to Lynn for 10 years. Where's Lynn? <laughs> Lynn is retiring, and we're very happy for her, but we're very sorry to lose one of the best people we've ever had in this industry. So Lynn, thank you for everything, personally and professionally. So Colleen's coming, so I'm going to just say that we have a celebration cup that for the first 150 people to come get a drink today um, at our celebration party after the awards, you'll get one of these um, anniversary cups. It's a clean canteen reusable, you get to keep it. And it'll be full of something, we're gonna give you a drink ticket. But it's only to the first 150 people that come to the awards ceremony, because we want you all to be there so you can help us celebrate with the award winners and talk to them about how we can help these great businesses continue to lead. So thank you for all you do. And I would just say to end, that it is a marathon, not a sprint. And don't look for your dreams to come true. Look to become true to your dreams. Together, we are a beacon of hope for the country. Thank you. I'm cheery is because this was a hard 10 years. This was really hard. And for all of you who've helped us, um, just know how much we appreciate you too. Thank you. So we are actually at our lunch break, but I think let's field uh, one to two questions and then Heidi's gonna be here today, so please come see her and ask your other questions. Gotcha, is, is this an opportunity for us to align with organizations we normally don't, like CASA and some of the others on the med and pharmaceutical takebacks in Monterey? We're not on the state water system. We're going to have to be making renewable water from renewable power with our partners next door at the sanitation uh, department. And I wondered if this is an opportunity to get our, our neighbors, uh, which a lot of us have, to align with this in terms of battling back big farmer because in our community we're putting renewable water out in the fields for agriculture mm -hmm. we're gonna be using that for our folks to drink and I just wonder if this is not an alignment for folks outside that we normally do not make partnerships it with to go is. and do that yeah we should all be looking for the strange bedfellows mix because every time we go into an elected official the first, if we say the business is with us, or like when we were just working on the carpet bill, when we said interface is with us, Tarkhead is with us, they went, oh, oh, okay. Because that shows them that it's there's division on that side. So the key is we can't be divided on our side anymore. We have to be aligned and all going in the same direction. 
because they are completely aligned and that Italian soup brigade is out marching around opposing everything we're trying to do. So um, yes, look for those strange bedfellows, look for different groups, think about, you know, we get, we get the doctors in Monterey getting very supportive. Um, the water district should be supportive. Um, anybody you can think of that's related, the drug abuse prevention community, obviously, very community, even the mental health community. I can't really see with all these bright lights, so I. Heidi, um, yeah. Hi. thank you for that fabulous uh, presentation and Thanks. all your work. Um, when you think about the upcoming battles with um, packaging and the current battle with carpet, can you comment on um, the uh, disposal via incineration threat that's coming up? Yes, so the, one of the big things, you know, Europe says we, we put incineration and disposal in it's the same. In Europe, they, they feel that it's better to do incineration to energy before you put it into the landfill. So in their hierarchy, it's a higher, uh, better use of the material than just disposing of it in the landfill. Um, we've been able to stop incinerators in California now for 20 or so years. The pressure to build them is going to come back. So what everybody has to be very aware of is one, there is not one type of burning. I wanna be very clear of that. My dad's a postdoc in clinical chemistry and I've been lectured on this many, many times. Um, in fact, he tells me saying that it's not a high energy or hot burn is actually not right because every feedstock has its own perfect burn temperature. And if you, some things need a high heat in order to have a complete combustion, other things don't. So we have to be very careful about our language on this stuff, but know that there are people out there who want to say we're doing landfill diversion. We're, you know, it's better to burn carpet than coal. You know, there, it's the blue sky initiative, you know, for clean coal, what, no such thing as clean coal. Um, we have to be very careful and look for this. Uh, we do not support burning per se at our organization, although some people have accused us of that. I wanna make this very clear. We have Covanta on the national board because they've been helping us with medicine disposal. Many of you could not have medicine disposal if we did not have free combustion from Covanta. Now, do we think combustion of medicines is the best thing in the world? No, but what else do we do? Flush them, throw them in the landfill? They tell us right now all we can do is destroy them on site. Guess what that means to hospice workers? They flush them. So, Sometimes there's layers to these problems and we have to kind of work through the different layers, but just know that I am afraid, and I agree with Miriam, they're gonna be pushing for burning and we have to be careful and we also have to look for uh, controls on these bills to make sure we know exactly where stuff is going. Because right now it's been really hard to figure out where the carpet's going and what they're doing with it and that shouldn't be that hard because it's public fee money. That was not even an internalized cost bill. So thank you for bringing that up. Anything else? Okay. So everyone, uh, the lunch break, it's our last hour at our exhibit hall that's open, so please hang